a silverware company that dates back to the 1800s and still around today not only survived tough times that happened kind of throughout the world but it survived a very dark past i'm matt and this is your town podcast As mentioned in the quick little intro, there's a silverware company that is in Oneida. And you might be thinking, where is Oneida? And if you're listening to this, you probably know where it is because you're probably somewhat near Oneida and us. But Oneida is a city in Madison County that is in the lovely, well, I guess lovely state, of New York. It's located uh, kind of west of the Oneida Castle and east of Wampsville. So, But it, more or less, if you're looking at a map of New York, look right pretty much dead center of the state. That's pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Uh, so Oneida is known for a couple of things. The Oneida Community Mansion House was home of the 19th century utopian Oneida community. Today, the 93,000 square foot National Historic Landmark features a museum, which has tours of permanent and changing exhibitions, overnight lodging, probably if you're into ghost hunting, I'm sure there's some creepy shit that happens there, a banquet and a meeting space. And if people want to get married there, you can get married there. Conferences, retreats, a whole everything, you know. There's also, also in Oneida a Gothic revival house that was designed by a prolific 19th century architect, Alexander Jackson Davis. They say you can't trust a man with two names. Can you trust a man with three first names? Oh, okay. He's going to trust him. I'm not going to trust him. Uh, the Society welcomes visitors to tour the home and kind of see what life was like in the Victorian period, which is a pretty cool thing. I don't know if you've ever been there. Uh, I haven't. No. I, yeah, I lived, so I lived between Oneida and Munville, mm -hmm. uh, which is where Foothill Farms is, is located. Yep. Behind an electrical supply store, actually. Ooh. Um, but Munsville also was the birthplace of a revolutionary steel farm plow. Ooh. Um, this farm plow took the agricultural world by storm at its time. And that company that started that steel plow is actually Briggs and Stratton Ferris Industries today. Oh, that's a, those are some big names. Yeah. And uh, so all pretty cool things in Oneida. But when you think Oneida, and a lot of people around here, they think the Silverware Company, a silverware company that is one of the world's leading stainless steel flatware providers, but with a very interesting, I don't even know if interesting is right. It has a past. It has a history. It, and maybe intriguing, maybe sickening, but either way, it was a past that involved the 19th century religious community also known as probably a cult that, um, you know, kind of had radical notions of equality, sex, and religion. And like I said, we might as well just jump into it now that we have your attention, because let's face it, probably I think the analytics said 90% of the audience is males. We said sex. Now you're listening. So radical sex. Radical sex. All right, here. So it all began with a man named John Humphrey Noyce. N-O-Y-E-S. If you've always been wondering how to say it, it's noise. I, I Googled it. And I love the thing that you can just Google and it says, how do you say this? And then somebody has taken the time and a lot of time because every word. And they say it. So th shout out to them. Not sure who it is. But Noyes was born September 3rd, 1811. So just a couple of years ago in Brattleboro, Vermont. Should have known he was from Vermont. No offense to the Vermont listeners, but uh, the name Noyes is clearly a Vermont name, in my opinion. So John Noyes, who worked variously as a minister, teacher, businessman, and a member of the U.S. House Representatives. Again, that is the father. And Polly Noyes um, was the aunt to Rutherford B. Hayes, if you don't know this, the 19th president of the United States. Heck of a mustache. So some pretty big names and pretty prominent family that this uh, the, the, the Jonathan Noyes comes from. So in 1831, we're going to fast forward because nothing really cool happened the first kind of 18 to 19 years of his life, probably a bunch of interesting weird shit but in 1831 he's now 20 noise was influenced by the preaching of charles grandison finney a leader in the second great awakening with another new york icon of sorts but this one in the rochester area one time i went to breakfast and they had something called the great awakening and i couldn't eat two of them but this maybe they took the name of their breakfast from this hmm. All right, so let's give a visual because, you know, obviously this is this is a podcast, an old school podcast, because, you know, on YouTube, the podcast is video, which we're putting them up there now, too. But this is more of an old school. So let's give you a little bit of a visual. So Noise and Charles Finney, for the people that aren't going to Google them, 
They're both rocking, which is a whaler style beard, which is a beard without a mustache, which is pretty wild. That kind of noise was so inspired by Finney that he actually tried to not only, you know, go with his, you know, teachings, but he actually tried to even look like him. And I don't know if you've seen a side by side picture of him or not, Zach, but it is like kind of very scary how they do resemble each other. I know the facial hair, but definitely there. But um, so so Finney taught at Oberlin College of Ohio, which accepted students without regard to race or sex, which, you know, in that time, a little bit of a different time. And then he served as its second president from 1851 to 1865. And its faculty and students were activists for abolish is well, that's a tough one. I'm gonna need it. Yeah. Why does Yes, abolitionism. I was looking at pictures of Charles Grandis and Finney's cold dead eyes. Wild, right? So you see Finney and then you look at noise. noise. Yeah. Pretty yeah. yeah. Even uh it's even interesting to see that they're portrait profile mm -hmm. uh noise definitely ripped that that pause that that poise that demeanor that look everything uh, from finney so it's it's very creepy. Uh, so he uh, so to kind of go back, Finney, second president, uh, 1851, 1865. So not only did the students do, you know, they were that, but the they were, you know, very big into the Underground Railroad, which, spoiler alert, we're going to have an episode uh, with the North Country ties to the Underground Railroad because obviously being on the St. Lawrence River, which is obviously next to Canada, a lot of things happened in that. All right, so let, let's go back to this. So for anybody that uh, doesn't know, and again, probably, not going to pause this and go Google stuff because that's why you're listening to us. The second Great Awakening is that no that that noise was inspired by was a Protestant religious revival during the 19th century in the U.S. The second Great Awakening, which spread religion through um, revivals and emotional preachings, sparked a number of reform movements. Uh, revivals were a key part of the movement and attracted hundreds of covert uh, converts to the new protest uh, Protestant. Protestant. That sounds churchy. D d and uh, Church. yeah, right. All right. So, uh, I mean, so with all that being said, I know you, you got something to kind of say uh, about the Second Great Awakening. Yeah, I, I, less cheerful, enjoyable, you know, side of the Second Great Awakening side, you know, churches and religious rituals mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Uh, this is also, this foundation is also the common, is where they, the common starting place for the 40 hour work week started and keeping time on a 12 hour clock. Uh, Cause these guys are so much about the grind and production and being productive and giving back to society, using your worth and all that jazz that they're like, you know what? We need to mandate hours that we spend at work. We need to be able to keep time so that we can keep track of how much we're working because of God. Yeah. So uh, boo for that. Can why not settle on a 30 hour work week, which I know some people that barely even work 20 hours, but they seem to have that. All right, let's go back to this. So noise then goes to college, graduated from Dartmouth then enrolled into a Andover theological seminary with a view to entering the Christian minister. Why are church words so hard to say? Or is it just me? They're hard. They're, they're, they're there's a joke in there. I'm going to move on. Noise left Andover to enter the Yale Theological Seminary so that he could kind of devote more time to Bible study. Because I'm guessing the first church school wasn't enough Bible study. So he said, hey, let's crank it up. Let's go to Yale. So while he was at Yale, Noise made what he considered a kind of major theological discovery. While attempting to determine the date of the second coming of Christ, Noise became convinced that the event had already occurred. His conclusion was that crisis. That's a that's an interesting crisis, not a crisis, but Christ's Christ's, Christ's. 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 second coming had taken place in 70 A.D. and that therefore mankind was now living in a new age. So, I mean, he, he's throwing out theories like this. Then he obviously, because, you know, very strongly opinion, he began to argue with his colleagues that uh, unless the man was truly free of sin then Christianity was a lie, and that only those who were perfect and free of sin were true Christians. So, I mean, we're not going to get into here and start, to, you know, having political on any show, political debates. We're definitely not going to have religious debates, but uh, this yeah, guy let's, did. Let's, uh, let's, we'll, we'll cut to that, and we'll actually do a reference to episode two of the Your Town podcast. Mm -hmm. You said 1831. Mm -hmm. You would have been at Yale. Yeah. 
what if that would have been about the time that Frederick Remington? Ooh, yeah, I'm pretty I sure. So yeah, so while you're looking that up, because that's a good one, and obviously episode two, which aired last Monday, was um, was about Frederick Remington and a, and a pretty cool one. So he's gonna look that up, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why he continued to kind of art wasn't no. I mean, we were close, and this yeah. this uh, this whole story is going to make its way through history and we're going to we're going to get into the Remington times here in a little bit. So uh so obviously he's arguing uh, with everybody and he eventually gets kicked out of Yale. Which Remington quit Yale. He gets kicked out. Um uh, and then his ministerial license was taken away. So he says, "You know what? I'm moving to Putney, Vermont, where he continued to preach declaring I took away their license to sin, and they go on sinning. They have taken away my license to preach, but I shall go on preaching. The Putney community began to take shape, and it started in 1836 as the Putney Bible School. So then, 1838, Noyes gets married to Harriet Holton. Initially, the couple had a traditional Christian marriage. In the first six years of the marriage, Harriet gave birth five times. Four, though, of these five births were premature. Only one of the children survived. These life experiences led Noyes to begin his study of sexual intercourse in marriage. So then we're in 1844. Noyes decided to live separately from his wife. He claimed that the separation brought satisfaction that neither he nor his wife had ever experienced before. Noyes spent the next few years developing his idea on male continents. Wow. Okay. So, so he just, he just made himself a man cave. More or less, and was just like, hey. I mean, and, and it's funny because, well, maybe it's not funny is the right word, but, I mean, it's not uncommon for some people these days to live in separate homes, live a happy life. But this wasn't a happy marriage or a happy life. And so that was, uh, we're going to move on to October 26th of 1847. Noise was arrested for adultery, but was released until his trial before the county court in April, uh, the next April. According to Harriet H. Skinner's October 29, 1847 letter to her mother, upon receiving word that the arrest warrants had been issued for several of his loyal followers, him and the group, they left Vermont. And guess where they went? Where Noyes knew some friendly perfectionists that had happened to own some land. Okay, so now, for any of those following along, it's now 1848. This is where the Oneida community was born. You might be thinking, what is the United Community? Well, it's a perfectionist religious communal society that practiced communalism. Man, these words are getting me. So more or less, it was the sense of communal property and possessions. Group marriage, male sexual continence. Is that continence? Like, yeah. And I think I think we do have a little reference in there as well. But uh, look that up. And mutual criticism. All right. So, no. Number one definition is authority control movies. I mean, maybe they practice. No, they didn't practice. Well, no. It's, it's no. Self-restraint, especially with regard to sex. Okay, so they they practiced that with the the males. The community's original eighty-seven members then grew to one hundred and seventy-two by February of eighteen fifty, two hundred and eight by fifty-two, and three hundred and six by eighteen seventy-eight. That's a lot of growth in just uh, not that many years. And then there was a there was a smaller community that were located in Connecticut. New Jersey, obviously Putney, where kind of a lot of this did start in Cambridge, Vermont, had some uh, some 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 communities as well. So the United Community strongly believed in a system of free love, a term which noise is credited with coining, which was uh, more or less known as a complex marriage where any member was free to have sex with any other who consented. And I mean, the exclusive relationships and a really big word that I'm going to skip over was frowned upon. There were a lot of really dark stories that come from this. And there's a lot that are pretty uncomfortable to read. And we are going to leave some of those really sick kind of dark ones out because it doesn't really affect the story and, and how this Oneida Silverware Company has a past. True. And I'm not going to get into it, but it is something that you see you see a lot more in these uh, like historical preservation societies, museums, experiences, that sort of thing, where like I know it's a big thing going on right now with, uh, with Thomas Jefferson's estate. Um, that the current curators are going through a lot of effort to stop the stop the whitewashing mm -hmm. of uh, of darker parts of American history of personal histories. I don't know when I went to the United Community, 
went on a tour there. Um, was it a three hour tour? I don't remember how long it was. Mm. Gilligan did that once. He did. Never came back though. Rip Gilligan. Um, but it, it was they they put a lot of first hand documents out, journal entries, first hand accounts, interviews, uh, that sort of stuff. It was out detailing like these darker things that we don't really need to get into for the purpose of the silverware company. But they didn't do a great job of coming right out and saying, hey, this was what happened. This is where we're now at with it. Uh, they did kind of gloss over it, which, you know, I like seeing the truth in things. But, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they developed it. This was, you know, three or four years ago. Maybe it's gotten better by now. But regardless, cool place. Um, a lot of really interesting stuff there. And the, the community itself, before we get too far into it, it's really interesting because it's like, like picture – a small city. All right. Okay. I'm picturing it. And you've got like your typically in these small, especially in New York, you've got like your small cities that have very distinct like business districts mm -hmm. and like, you know, municipal districts in that residential district. Well, the community, the United community still stands on the original ground, all the original buildings and everything, but the city has grown out around it. So you just drive by what we say it was ninety six thousand square feet or something like that. Um, it was pretty something big. Like that. Yeah, like this huge compound looks like a small, looks like a part of a college campus. Ninety three thousand square foot. Ninety three thousand square feet, and there's just like dudes named Jeff living across the street from it because they didn't develop the other side of the road. Yeah, so well. it's like this cool little pocket of history in town that you can walk through and come in and out of and you can see this snapshot of time surrounded by just like modern life it, it's pretty cool seeing like you know a, a, a hitching post for carriages right next to you know a toyota thunder yeah and um rumor has it there was a lot of coming in and out of in this community as well but um i mean don't don't feel free like don't have to turn this off or stop this saying oh these guys aren't going to get into you know the the the, the dark details well, like so we're not going to go into the we're, we're going to cover enough that's going to be very intriguing of this dark past but we're just not going to tell you the the the, the gross details but all right let's just jump into the, what is kind of cool about the community though is it did support itself through many successful industries they manufactured animal traps silk thread and grew canned fruits and vegetables small industries including the manufacture of leather travel bags palm leaf hats but obviously there was one trade that was pretty uh, ended up being a pretty good one that they did and that was silverware and that industry is still around today and the company was sure and manufactured yeah, which is pretty wild that uh, any company is able to survive that long. So all community members were expected to work kind of like he he did speak about in, in some of the practices, even with the Second Awakening and everything, each according to their abilities. So women tended to do many of the domestic duties, although more skilled jobs tended to remain with an individual member. The financial man manager, for example, held this post throughout the life of the community. Community members, they rotated through the more unskilled jobs, working in the house, the fields, and you know, kind of the different industries that were developed as Oneida thrived. It also began to hire outsiders to work in these positions. They were a major employer in the area with approximately 200 employees by 1870. I mean, that is a lot of community. That, that's a lot of employees for a lot of businesses. I mean, even I would have to imagine, you know, like a, a local smaller hospital where we're from, 200 is pretty good size employment, especially in 1870. So the silverware manufacturing began in 1870, uh, 1877, relatively kind of late in the community's life. It's like things started going really good. We found a good business and things went downhill. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll jump right into that. In, in June of 1879, one of Noise's most loyal followers, uh, followers alerted him that he was about to be arrested for statutory rape. In the middle of the night, Noyce fled Oneida for Ontario, Canada, where the community had a factory. In August, he wrote back to the community, stating that it was time to abandon the practice of complex marriage and live in a more traditional manner. The community form, uh, formally dissolved and converted to a joint stock company on January 1st, 1881. So, I mean, he's getting charged for at least, what, the second time? Avoids it again. Which, call back to episode one, we did an episode of a German Nazi pilot who escaped a whole bunch of, you know, scenario, different scenarios, much different. And he had a lion. This, I mean, 
who knows the, what these guys had? I mean, maybe it could have been the first lion in Oneida. So, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you want to touch on before kind of, you know, we, we kind of almost end this episode on not getting too deep into the darkness, but obviously there's more things that did come from there. And I know you talked to some local people and you have a little bit more knowledge of this. And obviously you guys kind of get the gist, you know, there's this cult like atmosphere with, you know, um, women, children, men, and they're just all able to do whatever they want as long as everything is consensual. But at the same point, it's the 1800s. It's the 1800s. You've got a religious overtone, um, you know, with, with divinity and divine correlations to what you're supposed to be doing. And it, it got messy. I mean, you can you can probably connect the dots. We don't need to get into too mm-hmm. many stuff that's going to require a content warning or anything like that. True. But it, but essentially, what it led to was men in places of power with divine influence backing them up were allowed to practice free love, free sex, um, come in and out of their marriage, and you know, lines sort of get blurred, ages get blurred. And we get situations where, like, Noyce found found himself into with the statutory rape charge. Yeah, it was just generally that sort of thing. So again, we don't need to get into it, so we don't, so we can avoid a content warning and triggering. Yep. You know, talk to sensitive subjects, but that's the type of environment that, unfortunately, these children and these, especially these young women, they that they were a part of. Yep. Yeah, they just kind of, you know, and some of them were, this was the only world, the only environment that they knew, and they didn't see that it was different. But obviously, uh, Noyes never returned to the United States. He remained a powerful influence over many of his followers, and uh, there was even a decent amount of them that left Oneida to go to Niagara Falls, where he resided. Um, Obviously... He ended up passing away April 13th, 1886 in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Uh, The body was returned to Oneida and is buried in the Oneida Community Cemetery with those of many of his followers still to this day. No? Hmm. Yeah, I'm probably not going to make a trip just for it. But uh, maybe if we do, we'll take a picture and we'll post it on all of the social medias of, of, of us there. And maybe, you know, as we go there in the area and see the, you know, the the factory or maybe the next time we use some of the silverware, we'll continue to do that as well. But there we go. In the early decades of the 20th century, Noy's son, Pierpont, consolidated the community's industries and focused solely on silverware production. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good idea. Company became known as the Oneida Limited and was the largest producer of flatware in the world for much of the 20th century. The community's second um, communal dwelling, the 93,000 square foot brick mansion house, survives today as a multi-use facility encompassing a museum, apartments, dormitory housing, guest rooms, a meeting and banquet facilities. Kind of like you talked about. You have this thing where a guy named John or Joe or whatever his name was is is, is there. and it's just. Just one of those things. I mean, just a wild story that happened in in a, in a community like that, but in, in an even more thriving, very well known business with a very very dark past. And, and go ahead. And recently, I want to say within the last ten years, um, as a night limited, I would say for actually it's probably more within the last five years, is because when I was living there, the Oneida Limited, the modern iteration of that, um, they actually caught wind that the silverware used in the White House and all of the Capitol Hill, uh, you know, the nation's capital's buildings where they serve food, they realized that the silverware was important, you know, from France or China or wherever, Um, especially in the White House, it's, I believe it was French silverware. (laughs) They had a petition going, um, and it kind of died out when, when the pandemic hit, but they had a petition going for them to be the only silverware used in washington dc because they are the only domestic manufacturer of fine silverware left in the country um yeah i could see that and then i I guess i could see the other point where they're like well did you know they had this cult back in the day and it's like well let's be honest there probably was some weird shit that went down in france and maybe as this podcast gets bigger will evolve into your town in France. But either way, um, th- this is another good one. Again, close to home and was kind of talked about by some people. So we talked about it. If you would like us to talk about your town, your stories, 
feel free to email them. Um, obviously, we have we have the email, the links everywhere. You can shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Matt at BeardLaws.com, Producer Zach at BeardLaws. We have the Yorktown. You, you can find us if you really want to. You can. And, and the chances are, if you're listening to this, you know us. So you can personally just send us a message. But uh, that's all we got. This is uh, this is good. This is episode three. We'll be back for episode four. Which uh, do, you, do you want to tell them a little bit of a, a potential preview of what we're going to talk about in episode four, real quick? Mm-hmm. Don't give them too much though. Yeah, Got to make them four, back. Episode four, we're sticking right here. We're coming back to Argensburg. We're now united. Coming back up to Argensburg. Um, Argensburg used to hold the St. Lawrence State Hospital, which was a cutting edge, the sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, psychiatric facility that saw incredible growth and experimentation in the treatment of mental illnesses, but also awful things like, you know, uh, the electric shock therapy and, and like lobotomies and stuff. Yeah, some nasty stuff. So if you're into that, or even if you're just into listening to us, penetrate your ear holes, come back. But before we say our goodbyes, I just quickly want to give a quick shout out to Wikipedia because you have all the information that we hope is really true. And there was also a cool article, news.usc.edu, that had a really cool story about the scandalous story behind a popular silverware brand that we did talk about there. So a little bit of there where we uh, read some articles and and brought some information to you. Um, We usually end this with a quote, but uh, I forgot to put the quote in there. So we're we're not going to do the quote. Well, we are going to do the quote. We're going to do a quick little quote. Um, while he's while he's looking up a quick little quote, we're just going to give you a quick thank you. Um, and if you guys could please go follow the YouTube, the Instagram, the Twitter, you know, if, if you want. But if you don't want to, that's fine. No, I'm not the boss of you, so so that's fine. So uh, he appears to be scrolling for one, and uh, I'm going to let you know that he's uh, he he's got one lined right up for you. Hmm. Never mind. Pump fake, guys. I mean, just just read one. All What's right. that one right there? Here's the oh. quote to end it. it. It's not going to be as irrelevant, and it's on me uh, because this was the research that I did. I let you down. But next week, uh, Zach's going to have one for you. So here's a random quote that he just found that probably doesn't have anything to do with this episode, but you know what? It's probably going to make it's going to it's going to relate to somebody. Kendall Talbot. Don't save your good wine, perfume, or cutlery for a special moment, because that moment is already here. Nailed it. We'll see you next episode for Season 1, 